Okay, so this is the final uh, lecture from part five of Music and Appreciation by Roger Kamian. Uh, this is on the Romantic era. So we start with program music. We talked about, I've talked about program music a little bit in the previous lectures, but program music is instrumental music, usually for orchestra or piano, um, that attempts to sound like something. Uh, it, it could attempt to sound like a story or a person or a place or even an idea. It has to be instrumental music because if you've got words, well then you can just sing about what you're trying to convey. This is an attempt by the composer to make it sound like something um, without the benefit of words. Um, it's called program music because the composer, in the title, and also a lot of times in performances, they would provide a written program. The concert goers would be given in the program, they'd be given an explanation of what the piece is supposed to sound like. That's where the term program music came from. Uh, not all music from the Romantic era is program music. The opposite of program music is called absolute music. Absolute music is music just for the sake of music. It's not music that's trying to sound like a specific thing. It's just music that's supposed to be great music. Um, you can usually tell by the title if something is program music or absolute music. If something has a title like I don't know, Pacific 231, which is about a train, it's supposed to sound like a train. That's obviously program music. If something has a title, say, Symphony Number no. 4, that's probably absolute music. That's not attempting to sound like something specific. There are a variety of types of program music that were composed in the Romantic era. Incidental music. Incidental music is music that is performed as background music for a play. It's just like movie music is today. It's not, there's no singing in the play. The play is just being acted on stage, but this music is supposed to help set the mood. And as I said, the, today's parallel to movie music is identical. Concert overture. A concert overture is one movement for orchestra um, that is supposed to convey a mood or set an idea uh, or set an emotion. Um, very similar to the symphonic poem that we talked about at the end of the last lecture which is one movement for orchestra that is supposed to, usually supposed to sound very specifically like something. And then the program symphony. That's like a standard symphony in that it's multiple movements, usually four movements, um, but it's supposed to be telling a whole story. There are some great program symphonies. Uh, we're gonna talk about Hector Berlioz in a moment. His Symphony Fantastique is a program symphony. Uh, Franz Liszt, who we talked about at the end of the last lecture, Liszt wrote a couple of program symphonies, his Dante Symphony, for example, based on Dante's Inferno. So these are all kinds of program music. Program music became wildly popular during the Romantic era and continues on to this day. So one of the great writers of program music was a French composer named Hector Berlioz, it's chapter 11. Um, Berlioz, like many of the composers talked about, came from a non-musical background. His father was a doctor, and he wanted Hector to study medicine. So actually, Berlioz started uh, music school, or I'm sorry, uh, medical school, and then quit and went to the Paris Conservatory. He was incredibly emotional, um, very over the top. He tended to leap and then think about what he was doing, which actually led to some events in his life that led to some of his greatest music. Um, he made money writing music a little bit, but he actually he made a lot of his money as a music critic, uh, writing articles for newspapers uh, about other people's music. He also became one of the great conductors, orchestra conductors, where he would direct orchestras and programs of other people's music. One of the first people to ever make a living doing that. Up to that point, it was most common for composers to conduct their own music, but not other people's music. Um, Hector Berlioz's most famous piece is his Symphony Fantastique, which translates as Fantastic Symphony. Now, he doesn't mean it as, hey, this is a fantastic symphony, um, although Berlioz was incredibly egotistical and believed that, uh, but Fantastique meant, in the French use of the word, meant supernatural. Um, so this is basically a symphony that tells kind of a supernatural or horror story. Now this is based, it's autobiographical, it's based on an event in Berlioz's own life where he went to the theater to see the Royal Shakespeare Company from England. And there, from the audience, 
he fell in love with the lead actress, whose name was Harriet Smithson. He decided that he loved her passionately and could not live without her, and he wrote passionate love letters to her. Of course, they'd never met in person, um, and he'd never even met her as her. He'd only seen her act out the part of uh, Juliet or Ophelia or Lady Macbeth, and so this is not really very logical, but Berlioz was not logical. He was emotional and passionate. Um, in real life, he wrote these letters to Harriet Smithson, and she rejected him because she thought he was extremely creepy. If they had had restraining orders in those days, she probably would have taken out a restraining order on him. He turned this into music by writing his symphony fantastique. The program for this symphony is that a brilliant young artist, who is of course Berlioz, um, is rejected by the woman that he loves, rejected by his beloved, and in a fit of despair, he decides to commit suicide by taking opium. Now that is not autobiographical. Berlioz, I don't think, ever would have killed himself. He loved himself way too much to kill himself. But in the program for the symphony, taking this opium casts him into a deep sleep where he has a series of visions. Each one of these dreams um, corresponds to a different movement of the symphony. It's a five-movement symphony, so a little unusual. Most symphonies, the vast, vast, vast majority of symphonies were only four movements. Berlioz wrote a five-movement symphony, although Beethoven had written a five-movement symphony, and Beethoven was a real hero of Berlioz. Each one of these movements, of these five movements in this program symphony, um, uses the same melody. Uh, which Berlioz called the Idee Fix, which means fixed idea. It's a theme, it's a melody that represents the beloved. It's been nicknamed the Smithson theme, or the Harriet Smithson theme, because it represents the woman that rejects the brilliant young artist. But he uses this technique called thematic transformation that was actually invented or credited to Franz Liszt, where you use the same theme in different movements, but you transform it every time so that it's fits the character of what you're trying to set. He wrote for a huge orchestra, much larger than the other orchestras that people were writing for. He wrote um, for instruments that people were not using in the orchestra at that time. This piece was written in 1830, so just three years after Beethoven's death. But he wrote for um, two low brass instruments called ophiclides, which today are played by tubas. So he basically wrote for two tubas, which no one had ever done before. He wrote for uh, four trumpets, which no one had ever done before. He included two harps in the orchestra, which no one had ever done before. If you think back to chapter four, I was talking about the classical orchestra and how the per whole percussion section was just one person playing two timpani drum. Um, Berlioz wrote for eight timpanis being played by two different players, and he actually had chords being played by the timpani. No one had ever done anything like this before. Berlioz was a genius. He was a little nutso, but he was a genius. So we're going to, I'm going to put a link to Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. Um, I think I'll put in the fourth movement, March to the Scaffold, where it represents in the um, five visions that Berlioz has. The first movement is titled Dreams. It's kind of about the artist falling into slumber. It's where you first hear the melody, the Smithson melody. The second movement um, is the dance movement, and that's titled A Ball, and it's about the artist dreams he's at this um, great dance, and in this case, the theme has been transformed into a waltz melody, and he dreams that he's at this dance, and he sees across the room, he sees the woman that he loves, and he tries to get over to her, but by the time he gets over there, she has gone somewhere else. The third movement, seen in the countryside, is the slow movement, and uh, this, uh, the brilliant young artist dreams he's wandering through the countryside, searching for his beloved, um, thinking about how sad he is because that's what you did when you were an artist. Um, in this case, the theme has been transformed into this very sad, um, this just very, very sad lament almost. The fourth movement, which is unusual structurally, march to the scaffold. He dreams that he has murdered this woman that he loves, and he's being marched to his own execution by guillotine, where they're going to chop off his head. So this march, which lasts about six minutes long, I think, in total, he's going through the streets of Paris. You hear the crowds alongside kind of shouting at him. At the end of the movement, he goes up the scaffold. They lead him up the scaffold. They put his head in the guillotine. He looks up, and at the front edge of the crowd, he sees the woman that he was supposed to have killed. And you just hear a solo clarinet play the theme, the beloved theme. Uh, but before he can say anything, the guillotine comes down and chops his head off. And you actually hear this in the music. The whole orchestra goes, Bump, 
and it's kind of the musical chop, and then the strings go plink, plunk, and that's his head bouncing into the basket. And then the drums and trumpets play a fanfare like they would do after an execution in Paris. And then the fifth movement, um, Dream of a Witch's Sabbath, uh, the brilliant young artist dreams that after being executed, he goes to hell where he witnesses this great party, this great um, gathering of witches and demons and devils, and guess who's the head witch? Of course, it's the beloved. Um, and he, uh, in this case, he transforms the theme into this kind of grotesque dance theme that kind of sounds like skeletons, you know, the whole thing's kind of supposed to kind of imitate skeletons and devils and demons dancing. The upshot of all this, by the way, is when Harriet Smithson heard this piece of music, she realized it was written about her, and she was very flattered and touched, and so she agreed to go out with Berlioz, and they eventually got married. And they stayed married for a little while, and they had a son, and then they eventually got divorced. But they are buried next to each other in the Montmartre Cemetery in Paris. Berlioz in a very, very large, elaborate crypt. Um, if I remember, I'll post a picture of myself and a friend of mine at Berlioz's grave site, we're both big fans of Berlioz's music. And uh, Smithson is buried next to him, but her name is very teeny tiny along the, uh, the bottom edge of that. Okay. Program music is represented by Berlioz in this lecture. I want to talk about nationalism. Now, I mentioned nationalism in the first lecture for this part, but I want to get into it a little more. Basically, things that went down in the first part of the 1800s, uh, Napoleon was invading all of Europe and countries took up arms to fight against him. Instead of hiring professional soldiers, which many countries had done up to that point, um, for example, in the American Revolution, a lot of the people that were fighting on the British side were actually Germans. They were German mercenaries who the uh, British hired to fight. They were called the Hessians. It was the Hessians who got drunk in Trenton, New Jersey when George Washington famously crossed the Delaware um, to fight them on Christmas Eve. Um, well, that didn't happen in the Napoleonic Wars. In those cases, a lot of common people of the different countries took up arms to try and defend themselves to build a and they built kind of a national pride over this. Also, Germany and Italy became politically unified at this time instead of being lots of little different independent states that are kind of loosely confederated. It became more of a country. So what we had is national spirit. Now, musical nationalism was inspired by this political nationalism, and it took form in a few different ways. Composers would write music that reflected their homelands. They could do this by either quoting folk songs and folk dances directly, or writing original music that sounded like folk songs or folk dances. Um, they might write a piece that's about the history of the people of, I don't know, of Germany or of Italy or of France, or about a legendary figure um, from those histories or a myth from those histories. Or maybe landscapes. Maybe they write a piece that is supposed to sound like uh, a great architectural or a great um, natural landscape. Uh, for example, there's a famous American 20th century piece called Grand Canyon Suite. And it's a suite of five movements about going to see the Grand Canyon and what the Grand Canyon is like. So that's a great example of nationalism. Also, of course, program music. Like all program music, the title and oftentimes a descriptive paragraph gives you a clue. So I want to talk about a couple composers when I talk about nationalism. The first is the first important American composer ever um, on an international basis. Now back in the 1700s there was an American composer named William Billings who was important in America. He wrote 340 different hymns and um, some songs that were very popular during the American Revolution, like one that was called Chester. But Billings' music was not played in Europe. Um, no one in Europe had ever even heard of William Billings. But Louis Moreau Gottschalk was the first American musician to become famous in Europe as well as in America. He was from New Orleans. He was of uh, Puerto Rican and Creole descent, Cajun descent. Um, he wrote music that utilized a lot of these different folk idioms uh, from African Americans. New Orleans was an incredibly diverse city even back in the 1800s. Um, his most famous piece, I don't know, he wrote a lot of pieces that are fairly well known today, 
but I'm going to put a link to a piece you wrote called Souvenir de Puerto Rico, um, which is a march. Uh, the movement I'm going to put up is the march, which use, utilizes a lot of Puerto Rico rhythms that he, um, that he learned from folk music on his mother's side of the family. It's really a cool piece. It starts out very slow, but then it gets really interesting. And it actually sounds a lot like ragtime music. If you remember our discussion of ragtime music and Scott Joplin, uh, Gottschalk was foreshadowing that by, by quite a while. Another great example of nationalism in program music is by uh, composer Frederick Smetna. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Smetna's biography, but he was the first really important Bohemian nationalist. Now, Bohemia is a region in what today is the present-day Czech Republic. Bohemia kind of became a, a country called Czechoslovakia, and then Czechoslovakia fragmented into a few smaller countries, one of which is the Czech Republic. Uh, so Smetna, another very famous composer, by the way, who died of syphilis, um, wrote a set of symphonic poems called Mat Last, which means my country, a um, set of six different symphonic poems, the most famous of which is the Moldau. The Moldau is the river, the main river that flows through Bohemia. It's kind of the cultural heart of Bohemia. Um, what this piece does is it, you're, imagine you're sailing along the river and you see all these different things. Um, you're going along, you're going downstream and you see a hunt, people riding their horses, galloping their horses, blowing horns in a hunt. That's represented in the first scene. And then we go past a wedding dance, because you go past this little village that's on the riverbank, and they've just had a wedding, they're having a wedding celebration, and they play this polka. Um, the musicians are playing a polka for everyone to dance to. And then the sun goes down, and it's just very calm and peaceful and placid, and that's the river of moonlight. And then you go through the rapids, which of course are very fast. And then the ancient castle, um, which was this, this uh, bluff that you would go past, which is where the ancient castle where the traditional uh, nobility would uh, live and rule Bohemia. And so this is a very nationalistic thing, and you hear all these great trumpet fanfares, brass fanfares kind of representing the, the great nobility of Bohemia. It's a really cool piece. It starts out very soft with a flute, two different flutes actually, playing, because um, they represent two different streams which join together and so when these two flutes come together then the strings come in and they represent the flowing of the river. It's a really neat and beautiful piece of music. Now Smetna gave way to Antonin Dvorak. I'm going to go ahead and put the whole slide up here. Dvorak was the leading Czech composer, Bohemian composer, after Smetna. Um, he grew up poor but he was extremely talented. He got musical training. It's a theme we've talked about in a lot of these composers of the Romantic era. Um, and he eventually became famous in his 30s. He was actually um, discovered by a composer named Johannes Brahms, who we're going to talk about momentarily. He wrote national music that was strongly influenced by Czech folk songs. Now, in the 1890s, Dvorak moved to New York. He was invited to come to New York to become the president of the National Conservatory of Music, which eventually became the Juilliard School. And so he lived there for a few years teaching. And one of the things he tried to teach American composers was to write nationalistic music. He basically told them, hey, you're all trying to sound like Europeans. You sound like a second-rate Tchaikovsky. You sound like a third-rate Brahms. Why don't you try to write original music being influenced by American idioms? One example of this, um, there was a student of his named Harry T. Burley, an African-American student who was at the conservatory, who introduced Dvorak to spirituals and to also, uh, also to music of Native Americans. Dvorak was very taken with this music and thought, this could be a grounding for a firm American school of music or style of music, because um, this is music that wasn't being performed anywhere, sung or played anywhere else in the world. Um, Harry Burley actually became very well known as an arranger and composer, and today, if you've ever sung a spiritual um, from sheet music, eh, there's a decent chance that he may have been the one who arranged it. Um, his arrangements are still in wide, wide use today, over 100 years later. During the summertime, Dvorak went to Iowa. Now, America in those days was a very odd place because, not on a bad way at all, but settlers would come over, a lot of people would come over from Europe, 
and they tended to group together in certain cities. Like people came over from Scandinavia, like from Norway and Finland. Many of them settled in the upper Midwest, like in Minnesota. Um, the Irish, many people, Irish settlers settled in Boston. Chicago also had a very large Irish population. And people that came over from Czechoslovakia, many of them, many of them settled out in the Midwest, like in Iowa, Nebraska. As a matter of fact, I had a student when I was teaching in Nebraska whose name was Dvorak, although they pronounced it Dvorak. Um, out in Iowa, there was a town called Spillville that was almost entirely populated by settlers from Czechoslovakia. Um, from, so Dvorak, during the summer when school was out, he actually traveled to Iowa and he would live there where he could hang out with people from the country where he's from and speak the language and eat the food and all that. And while he was there, he wrote some of his greatest music. Now, his symphony number no. nine, he wrote during his summers in Iowa, and he subtitled it From the New World, because what he wanted to do was write a piece of music utilizing American inspirations. And that's exactly what he did. Four movement symphony, which is you know pretty standard structure for symphonies, um, the different movements all have themes that were influenced by American idioms of music um, introduced to him by Harry Burley. Um, the second movement, I'm going to put a link to the second movement, because after the opening slow brass part, um, the section starts with the English horn, which is a lower pitched oboe. And this is an original theme that he wrote, influenced by spirituals. It's such a beautiful theme and so reminiscent of the other spirituals that were being sung that someone actually later put words to it, um, and it was titled Going Home. So if you've ever heard the spiritual Going Home, that was actually written by a Czechoslovakian guy who was living in Iowa. Um, I'll put links both to the second movement of the Dvorak Symphony and to a video of uh, someone singing Going Home. I think I have a video of Paul Robeson singing it, the, the great um, bass. Also going on at this time is the music of Tchaikovsky, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was Russian, he's the most famous Russian composer who's ever lived. Um, he came into music late, uh, a little bit late. He didn't start studying music until he was in his 20s. Um, and then, pretty soon, he wound up uh, teaching at the Moscow Conservatory. Uh, not that long after he'd started studying music, he wrote many major compositions. Now, Tchaikovsky was gay. And in those days, in Russia, which was ruled by, uh, the emperor of Russia was called the Tsar, uh, being homosexual was punishable by death. So Tchaikovsky hid his homosexuality. He even tried to dis uh, disguise it by getting married. Uh, that didn't work out well at all. He eventually tried to commit suicide, uh, not successfully tried to drown himself, but they saved him. Um, he got divorced two weeks after he attempted to commit suicide. But then life looked up for him a little bit because in that same year, a woman named Nadia von Meck, a very wealthy widow, began to support him financially. Now, they never actually met face to face. They only ever exchanged letters, but she was a great admirer of his music, so she actually gave him money, which enabled him to quit his teaching job and devote himself to composing. Uh, after that, he traveled Europe, he traveled the United States, he wrote six symphonies, he wrote a lot of famous music. Um, he's probably best known. Many Russian composers at this time were writing very folk-influenced music, very national music. Tchaikovsky was somewhat influenced by that, but he was also influenced by European music that he had heard. So he actually fused kind of this more general style of absolute music with Russian folk music. He did write some program music, but he also wrote a lot of absolute music. He wrote six symphonies, very famous, performed all of the time. Um, he wrote concertos, two piano concertos, a violin concerto, which are absolutely at the top of the repertoire. His operas are very famous and uh, performed a lot. His symphonic poems, his overtures, the 1812 overture, you've all heard the 1812 overture. For some reason in America, we play the 1812 overture on every July 4th, even though it's a piece of music written by a Russian guy celebrating the victory over Napoleon in the year 1812. And his ballets, probably his most famous music is ballet music, Nutcracker and Swan Lake. I'm going to post a link. Now the book, um, wants you to listen to his Romeo and Juliet Overture. That's over 20 minutes long. I'm not going to post a link to that. 
Although I will post a link to the love theme from Romeo and Juliet that we listened to in class once. It's probably the most um, known melody that he ever wrote. And it's a real archetype for love music. Um, but I am going to post a link to a movement of his from Swan Lake. Uh, this is a piece of music that you probably many of you have heard because it's been used so many times. All right, moving along. While that was happening in Russia, in Germany, a composer named Johannes Brahms was composing. Now, Brahms did come from a family of musicians. Uh, he was one of the greatest composers who ever lived. Um, he was kind of representative of a whole musical movement in Germany at the time. Uh, Brahms focused on absolute music. He didn't really write program music. But he wrote in all forms, except opera, never wrote an opera, wrote four symphonies, considered to be the greatest symphonies ever written, except for Beethoven's nine symphonies, wrote concerti, wrote solo piano music, he wrote art songs, just like Schubert and Schumann. If you think back to the uh, last lecture, Brahms also wrote art songs, wrote choral music, which is very well loved, chamber music. Um, Brahms was thought of to be kind of a, a throwback composer in some ways because he studied music of earlier composers and was very influenced by the music of earlier composers. But in some ways, he was actually very groundbreaking as a composer, especially with some things he did with rhythm. Um, we'll link to his, the third movement of his symphony number no. three. This is the, um, it's, it's very light movement, it's a very beautiful movement, and it kind of reflects a lot of what Brahms was about. While it's very traditional in some ways, it's a, just a beautiful melody. Um, Brahms is a very, very loved composer at his time and ever since. He's one of the most performed of all classical composers. Okay, we're gonna wrap up this chapter with just talking very quickly about, or wrap up this uh, unit by talking very quickly about three opera composers. Giuseppe Verdi was Italian, lived a very long life, lived to be 88. Uh, as a matter of fact, wrote two of his greatest operas when he was in his 80s. Um, the music he wrote was aimed for a middle class audience. He wasn't trying to appeal to wealthy people. He was trying to appeal to a general audience. So he picked topics that were very um, sensational, that would be very interesting and kind of, kind of keep people amused. Kind of like reality TV today, if you think about it. Um, now, he wrote many, many great operas. Um, all of Ver many of Verdi's operas are in the standard repertoire. Verdi and Mozart, their operas are kind of the cornerstone of operatic repertoire. Uh, but I'm going to play just one song for you, one aria from you, from an opera called Rigoletto. Um, the story of Rigoletto is the kind of story that attracted Verdi. It's the kind of story that's going to keep people really engaged. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, but basically Rigoletto is the court jester um, who has a very beautiful daughter, and the duke um, is a well-known womanizer and is going to try and seduce his daughter. Um, so Rigoletto plots the duke's death and his daughter sacrifices herself for the duke, and you know, it's very complex, but a very moving and engaging story. Uh, this is an aria that I would think you have all heard, or many of you have heard before. It's called uh, La Donne Mobile, which translates as woman is fickle. It's the Duke, who's a well-known womanizer, singing basically about how, oh, all women are the same at the end of it all. So I'm going to put a link to this particular aria for you. As I said, you'll recognize this inside of five seconds, many of you. If you've ever been in an Italian restaurant, they've probably played La Donne Mobile over the uh, loudspeaker. Now, the other great Italian composer, opera composer from this period, is Puccini. Puccini lived a little bit after Verdi, um, and whereas Verdi focused on these kind of sensational plots, uh, Puccini wanted to write operas that were more identifiable, that people could watch and say, oh, you know, I, I can identify with that character. Um, many of them were about love and tragedy. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's opera, so I mean, many of them are about tragedy. He was very big into the whole exoticism movement. Uh, he set his operas in foreign countries. He was Italian, 
but he wrote one opera, Torandot, which takes place in China, and another, Madame Butterfly, which takes place in Japan. Um, Puccini wrote some of the most beautiful music that's ever been written. His arias are incredibly popular. Um, as a matter of fact, Nessun Dorma is uh, maybe the most sung male aria ever written. Um, and uh, Un Bel Di, One Fine Day from Madame Butterfly, might be the most sung uh, female aria ever written. Not sure about that. But Puccini believed, in addition to using exoticism, he believed in this style called verismo, which was very popular in literature at the time, which literally means realism. Try to create characters who weren't over the top sensational, like a lot of Verdi's characters, but normal people placed in difficult circumstances. Probably his most famous um, opera is La Boheme. I don't know. He has a lot of really famous operas. But La Boheme is one of his most famous. Puccini wrote all of his own librettos, so he wrote the stories and the dialogue and everything himself before he set up the music. La Boheme, all right, I'm going to tell you the plot, and you tell me, or you think, what am I talking about? It's about young, artistic type of people who live in the great big city, the great cultural capital of the world. Um, they fall in love. They live in these nasty, run-down apartments that are, that, that are owned by um, slumlords, basically. And eventually, you know, two of them fall in love, but the woman catches a terrible disease and she dies. Some of you may recognize this as the plot for the musical Rent. Um, but it was originally the plot for La Boheme. Now, La Boheme takes place in Paris in the 1850s, and Rodolfo and Mimi fall in love, living in their nasty little apartments, and Mimi dies of tuberculosis. Now, Rent, actually, if you look at the credits for Rent, I believe that the plot, that the libretto, is credited to Puccini, although they set it all to new music, and they changed the characters, of course, um, they moved it to New York in the 1980s, and instead of tuberculosis, she dies of AIDS, but at the end of the day, the plot is exactly the same. I'll put a link in for the, um, it's a duet from Act One of La Boheme, where Rodolfo, um, Mimi comes to Rodolfo's apartment, and he's trying to write poetry because he's a poet, and she needs to get a light for her candle because her candle has gone out. Remember, this is Paris in the 1850s. They didn't have, uh, the poor apartments, they didn't have electricity or anything. And he says, well, she's really pretty. Maybe I'll try and, you know, get to know her a little better. And so he kind of contrives to spend some time with her by blowing out his own candle and pretending that he can't find her key and blah, blah, blah. It's really beautiful. It's a be um, the, the lyrics are, are very beautiful. The music is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, there's a reason why Puccini, along with Verdi and Mozart, is a real cornerstone of the operatic repertoire. All right, this leads us to Richard Wagner. Wagner was German, um, and he reinvented opera completely. Uh, he kind of paralleled, uh, he was born more or less at the same time as Verdi. They, they kind of lived uh, at the same time. Uh, Wagner was a terrible, terrible human being. He was just awful. Um, he would run up massive debts and then skip town and not pay them. He would um, have affairs with other men's wives. Very famously, there was a man named Hans von Bülow, who was a conductor, who championed Wagner's music, who helped Wagner to become successful, and Wagner repaid him by having an affair with von Bülow's wife. She eventually dumped him and ran off with Wagner. Um, he eventually, after moving around Europe and getting into trouble, he eventually settled back in Germany. Now, Wagner was very much into German nationalism, um, national myths, national legends. Uh, he was also anti-Semitic. That's another thing that made him, made him such a terrible person. He didn't like Jewish people. He actually wrote an essay called On Jewishness in Music. All of this, his focus on German nationalism and his anti-Semitism made it very natural when 50 years after his death, when the Nazi party came to power with Hitler in Germany, that they actually 
champion the music of Wagner, what kind of became the theme music of the Nazi party. Uh, having said that, as terrible of a person as Wagner was, and he really was, he was a brilliant musician who kind of ushered in a whole new era of music with his uh, inventions and developments. So, for starters, he wrote his own libretto. So he wrote, just like Puccini, he wrote all of the text and um, plots and everything himself. Now much of this he adapted from German legends, heroes, and myths. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about his operas in a moment, which bear incredible resemblance to both The Lord of the Rings, um, the series of books um, by an English author named Tolkien that was turned into a series of movies, and The Hobbit. And also, you'll recognize some stuff that you might uh, recognize from some of the Marvel movies, because you've got the German versions of the gods Thor and Loki and Odin um, all in these operas. But he didn't call his operas operas, actually. He called them music dramas, because he did away with kind of the standard structure of an opera, where someone would sing, the music would end, people would applaud, and then you'd move on to the next thing. Instead, he had continuous music. The music never stopped until the end of the act. Um, he wrote for a huge orchestra in the pit, um, in front of the, uh, and below the singers. And he used his orchestra in very new and creative ways. His operas were very long. He wrote operas, some of which lasted over five hours. Some of them are more normal opera length, like two to three hours. But he wrote some operas that lasted five hours. It's incredible. He believed in this concept, which he called universal artwork, which combined conceptually the music, the libretto, the sets, the dancing. Everything had just kind of had to be fused into one massive artwork. Um, this is one of the new ideas that he was introducing. His music was inspired by the rhythms of German speech, which is why you should never, ever sing Wagner in a translation, um, because musically it doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you sing it in German. And now he came up with an idea, which he kind of borrowed from Berlioz, which he called the leitmotif. The leitmotif is the same as the E-Day fix. If you remember, we were talking about Hector Berlioz and his... Um, writing of a melody which represented a specific character, and then this melody occurred in every movement of this movie. It was called the Idee Fix. Wagner took that a step further. The leitmotif is music, a melody that represents a person or a place or an object in almost every major person or major place or major object in Wagner's operas has their own theme music. It's theoretically possible to follow along with the music in a Wagner opera and know what's happening without any words being sung at all, if you know what the leitmotifs are. Now, Wagner's magnum opus was The Ring of the Nibelung. Uh, it was a series of four operas, Das Rheingold, The Valkyra, Siegfried, and Gedrudemerung, which translates as Twilight of the Gods, four operas which, all told, make up around 17 hours worth of music. But, and you see when you look at the um, PowerPoint, all these are screenshots taken from different performances of The Ring. It's based on these myths that I was talking about, Nordic mythology. It's about a magic ring which um, gives the wearer ultimate power, but also leads the wearer to their ultimate doom. It's about the gods and the eventual fall of the gods and their being replaced um, by man. It's got heroes. It's got, this, is, uh, this is Loki, the god of the trickster, the god of fire. Um, this is Albrecht, who kind of who created the ring. This is Valhalla, the home of the gods. Um, this is from an original production. That's Brunhilde, who is the Valkyrie, who is one of the major characters. There are two great operatic stereotypes that I think most people are at least familiar with the idea of the sad clown, that's from an opera called Pagliacci, and of the woman with the uh, horns on her helmet, the shield and the spear singing, that is Brunhilde from Wagner's Ring Cycle. Oh, and there's a dragon also, by the way. Really, it's, I mean, many people have written about Wagner. As a matter of fact, there's been more written about Wagner than any other composer, including Beethoven. And it's thought that the whole Ring Cycle is basically um, 
an analogy about how the quest for money and power will ultimately destroy you and potentially destroy society. Wagner was so famous that he, um, the king of Bavaria, King Ludwig II, actually financed the building of an opera house for him. This opera house still stands today. It's in Bayreuth, uh, in Germany, and all they perform is Wagner opera. You know, this is a drawing of it about when it was built in the 1800s. This is as it stands today. This um, is the inside of it. So every summer they have a big festival, a big Wagner festival, where they only perform his operas and musicians from all over Germany are invited to come participate. So, here's some more scenes from the Valkyra, um, sorry, from the Ring Cycle. Uh, this is Votan, this is Votan. Notice Votan has an eye patch, because Votan is Odin, just like in the Marvel movies, if you've seen Thor. Uh, I will put a link to music from Wagner's opera, uh, perhaps The Ride of the Valkyries. Maybe I'll put that one up there. That's one that everyone knows. So, the final slide in this unit, I know this was a very long lecture, is a review, basically. The Romantic era is an era with a massive number of important composers, and I've talked about a lot of them. There's a lot going on here. But ultimately, a lot of this, what happened in the Romantic era uh, led us musically into the 20th century. So now there will be an exam, online exam, based on the Romantic era. You will, of course, need the PowerPoint and these lectures to successfully complete this exam.